Okay. Let me start by clarifying the quote. It is the only topic that I've ever worked on that in my private life people are interested in. <laughs> I do hope that I did cover a few other topics in my, that, that at least you would be interested in. So, okay. So, how, how to refurbish uh, all buildings by 2050? Well, this was a very nice topic we got from uh, Mr. Hodson. So, thank you very much for that. <coughs> And indeed, it is in the context of the 2050 roadmap and in the context of the energy efficiency directive that we have been working on this topic. Um, so, I mean, as Jean-Michel already said, the THINK reports, um, you can see a picture there. And not only do we make these reports about 40 pages, we also um, then produce a policy brief about four pages so that more people can read it. In this case, uh, the project was led by Peter Kadriak, Professor Kadriak, and you see there the names of the research team. Okay, so quick introduction. So why, why buildings first? Well, uh, we don't only live and work in buildings, uh, they are all over. They are also really responsible for a very significant part of greenhouse gas emissions and of uh, energy consumption. And here you see the numbers. Then the next thing is, okay, we have this situation, but why refurbish? Um, why not simply renew? Well, then here you have to know that if you look at the 2050 energy roadmap, we have a very, very ambitious target there for the, for the building sector. Um, the target is to have really low carbon buildings, all buildings roughly, uh, by 2050. So then what to do? I mean, we can wait, it's true, some buildings will be demolished, so they will be renewed, but we know that the lifetime of buildings is quite long, so lots of the buildings that are around today, probably including this one, will still be uh, in 2050. So then refurbishment is the only option we have for not maybe all buildings, but many buildings. Then why think? Well, in this case, think was asked to think about these two issues. So first, what are the trade-offs? So what do we understand under refurbishment? Uh, what can we do? And, and, and what, what, what will, will we think will happen? Then, of course, uh, we, we are typically give policy advice. So the second question is, what are the policy options? Once we know, what are the trade-offs? OK, so let's talk a bit more about these trade-offs. The first trade-off, as already said, is we could simply accelerate the, the, the renovation of, of the building stock, or we, um, um, we, we make, uh, so we could make new buildings more quickly, or we refurbish existing buildings. There is a trade-off clearly there. Second trade-off is, um, okay, we have to refurbish the existing building stock, so we can do much, many more buildings, or when we refurbish a certain building, we can go deeper and achieve more. Uh, energy savings. Then a third trade-off is we can do more now or we can maybe wait to a certain extent uh, for technology development. And the fourth and last trade-off is what are we actually going to do? So are we going to simply reduce the energy consumption of our buildings? Are we going to convert maybe to electricity as is projected in the scenarios of the roadmap? Or um, we can also integrate the renewable um, energy generation. Because if we talk about renovation of buildings in the energy roadmap 2050, we, are, we have a carbon target. So that means you, can, you have these uh, three options, basically. Okay, so this is introduction. Then what we did, of course, in the, in, in the scope of six months, you cannot run new <coughs> models, you cannot do new simulations. So on this part of the, the report regarding trade-offs, what we did is we looked at existing studies. And then there are a few main findings. Uh, first, I, could, I should make a small remark that the, the, the number of studies are quite limited. Um, in other areas of energy policy, typically on the generation side, you find many more studies. Still, we found a few, and, and they, they, they seem to point in the, in the same direction. First, what they say is that it's not enough to increase the rate, so not enough to do more buildings. We need to do more buildings plus go deeper. So it's not really a trade-off. Uh, to a certain extent it is, but we need to, to act on both issues. Then what we also see in most reports is that we will, I mean, one size does not fit all. Uh, we have the example of, um, of, of, let's think of a holiday house. We should not go as deep in refurbishing that. We spend only a few hours in a year there. So that's an extreme example. But in general, think of uh, refurbishing buildings like a generation mix. There is a deepness mix. So some buildings we will go very deep and others less. Then, 
Uh, what we also uh, see in all the studies is that there are very significant differences between member states in this area. Um, it's both in terms of the building stock and the way buildings are used in different countries. Uh, the last finding of, of these studies is that a massive amount of uh, money needs to be invested if we really want to achieve that target. Uh, and most of it is expected to come from private actors, private building owners and users. Okay, so that's for the trade-offs. Then what does that mean for policy options? You can think that there are roughly three uh, categories of, of policy options. One is market facilitation, other is public support, and third is regulatory instruments. Let's talk a bit more about these three. Uh, first, in the report, we discuss, of course, there is uh, many opportunity to improve awareness of, of market players. We can even go as far as organizing a market, doing a kind of market design, as we have seen in a few member states like the, like the UK, and this can help. Then public support. Here there, is, there has been uh, some interesting studies on how to use, make best use of existing subsidies through all kinds of financing mechanisms. Again, with some very interesting experiences at the member state level. And the third is regulatory instruments. And here um, we, we, we went a bit further on what are the options. Um, and think of this framework here. So when we, as, as a building owner or user, are going to refurbish, the first thing that happens in this decision process is, OK, I have to be convinced to do something. Then the next step is that somebody, me, myself or somebody else, will decide what materials, products to use in this refurbishment. And then hopefully this will lead to an improved performance. Um, of course here there is a behavioral element because if I have a very nice house, very nicely refurbished, but I leave my windows open, that is not very clever usage. So you have these three elements. And then you can think of regulatory instruments working on these three um, issues indeed. You can have price incentives, that's overall, that will have an influence on these three parts of the refurbishment decision process. But then you have regulatory uh, instruments that can directly uh, target actors, like we have in the Energy Efficiency Directive, directly a target to uh, retailers or energy suppliers, so that's a nice example of that. Then we can have regulatory um, actions targeted at which materials or which products we choose when refurbishing. Think of technical standards or all kind of, uh, of rules. And the last one is um, regulation targeted at the output. So is it really leading to an improved energy performance? And there we are talking about regulation of outputs. Okay, so these are the options. Now, what are the main findings of our report? Regarding market facilitation, we, we conclude that it's not enough. I mean, it's very important to reduce the cost of achieving the target, but it's not enough to reach this target because the expected investments, these billions I just showed, are, are beneficial for society, yes, but not necessarily economical for the private uh, actors that are expected to do these investments. Then what about public support? Can we make it with uh, s subsidies or any other type of financial instrument? Again, we argue it's not enough because it is so big, um, the investment we need to do, and we have this current context with uh, public budget constraints. Then the only option we are left with is uh, regulatory instruments. So they are really required if we take this target of low carbon buildings by 2050 seriously. Then what to do? Well, first is at which level do we want these instruments to be implemented? Uh, so is there any role for EU institutions? Uh, then what we say in the, in the report is you can think of two possible roles. One is ensuring that it is dealt with at the national level, so ensuring commitment at national level. This is what uh, we, European institutions have been doing in many other areas of the energy policy. And here, again, you could think of uh, national building refurbishment targets and national building refurbishment <coughs> action plans as already introduced by the Energy Efficiency Directive. So in this way, this is already uh, taken care of. But what about this other role? So um, maybe it, it is true that the situation of the building stock is very heterogeneous in, in most countries. So you might need different instruments in different countries, but still there could be a role for EU institutions to facilitate the implementation of uh, regulatory instruments at the national level. And then this has led to uh, these few uh, recommendations that I want to share with you. 
So first is on price incentives. So is there any role there for EU institutions? Yes, of course. We still have these end-user regulated prices in electricity and gas. Uh, so there is a role there for EU institutions to, to, uh, to abolish them. Also, the EU has already been active internalizing the cost of carbon into the building refurbishment decisions, but many, much more can be done there. Regarding regulation of inputs, there is already a lot of uh, legislation, eco-design, labeling directive, and of course here the role of the institutions is to continue this process to widen and strengthen these standards um, and labeling. Then the last part is regulation of outputs. So here, um, if you want to regulate output, you need to be able to measure performance. So you need uh, um, a, a kind of certificate scheme that you agree on, and actually it exists already at national level, but what we recommended is that maybe it could be opportune to, to have an EU um, uh, energy performance certificate scheme, not the mandatory one, but a voluntary one, because we have seen in other areas um, that if EU makes such a scheme, often many countries follow, it even reduces their burden, administrative burden, to implement these schemes. So it, we see in this area a, a big opportunity for the EU to make a, a move. This, this is the schemes we are talking about, so you already see a few examples from different countries, but there are some issues regarding how they have currently been implemented, and um, so to have an EU initiative could definitely help here. Okay, that is it for the report. But today, we, it's our conference, so we wanted to give uh, an additional recommendation. So what you see here is actually Brussels from the sky, and you see the heat dissipation of the different buildings of Brussels. So for those of you that do not understand the Dutch, blue, blue is good, red is not good. So you see a blue building here. Uh, some of you are already recognizing the building. That's the Berlamont. So it, it, it was reconstructed, indeed, in, in, uh, not, not that long ago. And since then, it is a, is, a, is a very nice example. But what about these buildings here? This is actually the European Parliament. So there is still some room for improvement uh, uh, there. Okay, so that leaves maybe some room for discussion. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.